Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. Listen carefully to my words. Let this be the consolation you give me. Bear with me while I speak, and after I have spoken, mock on. Is my complaint directed to a human being? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled. Clap your hand over your mouth. When I think about this, I am terrified. Trembling seizes my body. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows calve and do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of timbrel and lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? But their prosperity is not in their own hands. So I stand aloof from the plans of the wicked. These are the words of Job. Jesus told a parable. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up, it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Last week we read this. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or a stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And what does it take to be a good fish? In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a drama. We've been reading the Apostle Paul, and he keeps, he keeps, he keeps warning people about a judgment that is coming. We started with Job, and Job, as with Psalms, other prophets in the Old Testament complained. The wicked prosper. God does nothing. When will they be judged? It came to the point of many seeing all of this and watching the wicked go down to the grave in peace and the good get sent to the grave in violence and said, can there be justice? Will there be justice? Well, Jesus' story imagines a day after the day when there will be justice. Now, Job's complaint was exactly this. Then they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? That's their point. Paul has been traveling around, well, he's been in Macedonia, and he's been in Athens, and he left Athens and he went to Corinth. Corinth was the largest city in Greece. It was in the most strategic location, just where 
just the little land bridge between two major areas of Greece. And as we'll see, things came in from the Adriatic and would go to the Aegean, the the, the Mediterranean was the superhighway of the Roman Empire. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. Now, Pontus is the area in red that you see. Pontus basically means bridge. That's the bridge that connects Macedonia to the area that today we call Greece and Constantinople will eventually be right in that area too. Notice how you're putting cities at strategic choke at strategic choke points. Who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Corinth, as I mentioned, you can see the tiny little part of land that it was. In fact, often people would, the ships would come in, goods would be transported over the three miles up by land, go back onto ships and continue their route around. It's the largest city in Greece. It's a vital trade and transportation hub. It had a reputation for fast money and debauchery. And when we eventually get around to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we'll deal with Corinth in a lot more depth. Every Sunday, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Of course, this is Paul's method. He goes to the synagogue, and you've seen the pattern before. He goes to the synagogue, things get stirred up, people get angry, um, either he gets in trouble with the um, the non-Jews in the city or with the people in the synagogue who don't like what he's saying or some combination of the two. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So, in other words, once help came from Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, some of those cities, he now had some resources where he didn't have to spend as much time doing the tent-making work to put food in his mouth, but he could devote his time exclusively to preaching. But when they opposed Paul, but when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he decides that he's going to stop debating in the synagogue and he's going to focus his attention exclusively on Gentiles who are curious and interested in Jesus and the resurrection. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of 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 Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Now, that would mean that he's not a Jew. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And so here in this city, a number of people begin to become interested in Jesus, begin worshiping, chirp, worshiping together, probably in a, sim, in a, in a manner synag similar to the way synagogue worship was. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Now, we're going to pay some attention to this message that he receives from the Lord. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. What does that mean? Who is he talking about? Now, I actually put this out on Twitter and got a lot of interesting uh, responses to the question. I don't think he's talking about um, the Jewish community. He's already had a major falling out with them over the synagogue. The church at this point is growing, but still quietly like tiny. It's quietly, quietly, is quite likely still quite tiny. It's small. Um, and 
we'll see fall, Paul fall into despair um, in, in one of the books to Timothy when he lamenting the fact that everyone has abandoned me, everyone has left me except for these few people when he's in prison. Paul seems to ride his moods up and down. So he must mean others in this cosmopolitan city with a reputation for affluence and hedonism. In fact, I think there's a theme in the Bible about such people. And it seems that, well, we always sort of look around and pass judgment upon what we see, but we should always remember we don't see what God sees. It reminds me very much of this story from the book of 1 Kings. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. This is after the showdown on Carmel. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, you're a dead man. Elijah was afraid. Now again, this is after the scene on Mount Carmel where God shows up by lighting fire to the altar that he built and everyone, he wins the day. Next day, Jezebel says, you're a dead man, Elijah. This prophet, bigger than life, panics and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to, a, to the broom bush, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some, baked, so was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Now, if you read N.T. N.T. Wright's biography of Paul, the first chapter is about zeal because that's who Paul was. He was zealous. And that's the word that the Bible uses of him. He's zealous, just like Elijah. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I'm very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. This project that you started with Abraham, Lord, it's hanging by a thread. I am all that stands between you and disaster. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Now, anybody who knows these names knows Haziel is going to be brutal to the northern kingdom of Israel. And anybody who knows Jehu knows Jehu is going to be brutal. These are two brutal men. We don't really look upon them as godly in any way. 
and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. You want to die, Elijah? You want to be done? Okay, a few more things to do, and you'll be done. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. Elijah, you think you know so much? You think you understand what's going on? You think you look around and know exactly who's who and what's what, and it's time to despair and throw in the towel? All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Where were those people? Can we see them? Where are they? Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sold weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did all the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Here's the rest of the story. Remember what the Lord said to Paul, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack you or harm you because I have many people in this city. Well, while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. <laughs> It would be nice if this story had a magical conclusion where Paul was somehow lifted up and there everybody held hands and sang Kumbaya and they buried the hatchet with the part of the synagogue that didn't like hearing about Jesus and the resurrection and didn't believe and no, that's not what happened. Paul was sort of attacked, but he was not harmed or killed. Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, took the brunt of it. And Gallio, well, what kind of a man he was, he showed no concern at all with someone being beaten. That's the rest of the story. That's a very believable story. So often it works this way. We continue to live in the world as Job did in many ways. There are weeds and wheat intertwined. The wicked thrive. God waits. How do we live? Who are those good people? The people that God says, I have many people in this city. In Corinth, really? We can't see them. That's the point. We can't see them. God does. God knows. When we count noses, we don't know how to count. We can't see in people's hearts. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know what the future holds. It's especially helpful to remember that darkness came in noon on that Good Friday. The hopes and dreams of those who knew Jesus were dashed. Two sides that couldn't agree on anything in their struggle over what would befall of this nation, of the Jews, of Galilee and Judea back in the first century. The one thing they could agree upon was that this man Jesus would be better off dead and the world would go along just the same. And it was in that moment that God was doing his work. God said to Elisha, Elisha, you're my servant. You don't know all things. Obey me, trust me, 
keep moving. I have things in hand. He says to Paul, don't be afraid. I have many people in this city. Keep speaking, keep preaching. You're doing my will. We look around and we judge by appearances. We don't know who God has or how he has them. God can use Babylonian armies to destroy his temple and Roman soldiers to kill his son. Salvation is from the Lord. Wait patiently upon him and walk in his way. As a church, we gather and we begin with these words. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. 